Hey folks, your OS reviews. You're watching our retro throwback look at the Motorola Charm. This was one of the first few Android phones that Motorola put out in 2010, and it came with Android version 2.1. It was really meant as a social messaging oriented phone with Moto Blur, which was a skin on top of Android that uh, Motorola did initially, and it was quite obtrusive, but it did integrate multiple I am clients as well as social messaging apps that tied into the home screen so it was very easy to reply to friends and family for instance because it is one of the older android phones it does have very outdated specs by today's standards it had interestingly enough a ti omap processor which uh, is single core of course clocked at around 600 megahertz and had 512 megabytes of ram memory was practically non-existent so you needed to insert your own micro sd card to have more apps as well as multimedia files be downloaded onto the charm and there was also a 3 megapixel camera on the back in addition to a 2.8 inch TFT LCD display on the front which was 320 by 240 pixels. It's a capacitive screen with capacitive controls for going to the menu, home, and back as well. So what's really interesting about the form factor here is it's a vertical QWERTY phone, which we don't see a lot of running on Android. So there was this pretty comfortable QWERTY keyboard below. Obviously not as good as a BlackBerry keyboard, just because the keys themselves are not layered in this way that uh, is very similar to, let's say, a keyboard on your computer. So it, everything here is aligned perfectly, so it takes a little bit of adjustment to get used to. And there's also arrow keys down below here. But what I will say is that the keys themselves are very tactile, they're dome, they're easy to press, and they're actually quite large. So if we compare it next to an older BlackBerry, you can see here that the keys themselves are decently spaced and next to a modern day smartphone you get a, a comparison of the size here it is quite a wide looking phone because of this unique form factor so the top here featured a earpiece um, and also an led indicator but there was no front facing camera so that was pretty typical for phones of this uh, era the bottom here featured access to a micro usb port for charging there was a volume rocker which is pretty tactile a very boxy shape here the phone came in multiple colors we have kind of this magenta version that you see here, which made the phone quite unique looking. The top had a standard 3.5 millimeter headphone jack and a power on off switch as well. The back has a few other interesting features up its sleeve. There's this optical trackpad, which Motorola called its back track pad, which was consistent on most of its phones, even entry level phones, when uh, Motorola was rolling out its 2010 lineup. So you saw this on phones like the Backflip, uh, the Citrus, so on and so forth. So it allows you to navigate the UI and click on things without obtrusing the display on the front here. So it was one way to minimize, uh, you know, whatever you're doing if you're interacting with multimedia, for instance, and selecting a link or you're web browsing and you don't want to hit on something by accident. For for instance. So otherwise, the phone itself weighed 110 grams. It did have Moto Blur, again, version 1.5. And uh, essentially, that's it. It's a pretty typical Android phone as far as specs because it does have Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, GPS, all those standard things we've come to expect. So behind the back cover, there is all, there's also a lanyard strap here. But uh, you can kind of tell from the colors, from the QWERTY keyboard and the overall layout here, this is really meant as a social messaging phone for younger audiences. And as hence, it was fairly affordable. Uh, priced at around $100 with a two-year service agreement. Here's the boot up sequence. Again, it's gonna take a few seconds longer just because this is an older device with a slower processor. But uh, after this, it's gonna go through this blur screen in addition to the T-Mobile screen. We should be at the Android uh, main screen. What we can kind of glimpse from this boot up process though is that the display here is pretty bright and vibrant although view angles aren't the best. It's just a regular LCD and obviously the pixel density by 2017 standards is not really high but uh, you can see that otherwise it still remains a fairly usable uh, screen. So after this boots up, there we go, we have access to our home screen. You can see it's uh, fairly sensitive as far as the touch sensitivity is concerned and I can also use the touchpad on the very back to navigate using my fingers swiping left and right through gestures. I can also tap, double tap on it to bring up the virtual kind of on-screen cursor and I can tap on various icons a bit more easily. Great for tapping specifically on smaller icons and after a few seconds it goes away and I'm back to using it as a traditional gesture based pad for navigation. So taking a quick look at some of the preloaded applications on here there is access to a few bloatware but not too much. There is Motorola's blur accounts which was Motorola's attempt to integrate social messaging various uh, features into this one platform so it included things like Twitter, Facebook and it consolidated it into this one hub so that whenever you have uh, you know a new message it would come in the form of a blur message and there's also alarm and timer on here Amazon MP3 
uh, typical apps such as a camera and camcorder app. There's also the typical WebKit-based browser for navigation, email client, gallery, Gmail client, in addition to navigation. Um, this device, again, has GPS on board. There's also a Slacker radio app in addition to a preloaded YouTube app and a Wi-Fi calling app. So those are also some special things that you'll find here. Finally, there is a Motorola phone portal and a quick office suite built on here, which allows you to very quickly edit and uh, look at Word, Excel, and PowerPoint documents when on the go. It makes it for a pretty compelling productivity tool and really takes advantage of this QWERTY keyboard, which a lot of other devices you know, really don't have. So it makes typing out messages and editing things a lot easier in addition to that trackpad. If I dim the lights here, you'll see that the track, the keyboard here actually is backlit to a certain extent. It's a little hard to capture exactly on camera, but it makes it uh, pretty visible and easy to see uh, again when you are in a darker environment. Taking a look at the camera app next, again this is a 3 megapixel camera, so not anything to write home about, but there are a few things that you can edit, including turning on geotagging using the GPS antenna on here, changing the resolution, I can tap on here for more details, zooming in, zooming out, I can also use, use a few pinch gestures for that, and this is just the digital zoom, but uh, otherwise you can tap on the settings here to switch to the camcorder mode to get a panoramic uh, assist if I want to capture a longer image that's possible here. Add a few tags for my images, go through settings here to change things like the image resolution again, uh, and so on and so forth. So not too much that you can do, including filters, but there are a few options that you have you know, right out of the box. So if you wanted to take an image, I would just capture that once, but you do need a micro SD card to store any images since there isn't any internal memory. The capacitive controls below the screen are fairly sensitive, so they're relatively easy to tap on and to press, and uh, general usability from navigating the UI, making phone calls and the such, didn't really experience any hiccups, which is a nice, to, nice to see and nice to note. Um, some interesting design elements of this phone, though, is that there isn't a dedicated uh, kind of number area down below, but instead since they have just a small keyboard, they have a number array on the very top uh, like you would find on a laptop. But on a lot of smartphones that you have see with keyboards, they tend to also feature it down below here in a more grid-like icon, so you can also dial it in the traditional T9 view when you're on the fly, but you can see that's not exactly the case here. Um, otherwise, arrow keys are pretty easy to use and to navigate the main UI if you don't want to use, again, the trackpad or the touchscreen. And there's also some quick shortcuts to the camera, to the search, as well as to the mail application. So you can use geotagging as well to you know, access that fu functionality. Something I've kind of noticed about the, the keyboard, though, is it's uh, completely square shape does make it you know a little bit tougher to get used to than a dome keyboard that has the same kind of layout and slanted edges as a regular computer keyboard and one of the notable omissions is that there isn't really a super accessible underscore key it's not a huge issue but in case you have an underscore icon in your gmail or something you have to really hunt and peck for it as opposed to one that really features it predominantly just on the shortcuts of the keyboard so that's one of the interesting design elements that you'll see on here. Otherwise, another preloaded app here does include, rather interestingly, uh, MySpace, so it kind of shows the phone's age, as opposed to Facebook or Twitter as th that's built in, and also slightly tweaked versions of um, music player as well as radio support if you plug in a pair of headphones, um, that, uh, and song identification where you play a few seconds of a song and that it will identify what title it is, that have been built in by, by uh, Motorola here, but everything else remains fairly uh, loyal to the stock build of Android that you see here, which is again a very early build of that. Tapping on this for a few seconds longer, you can see Motorola widgets, tr a backtrack toggle to turn this on and off, I can go through the Bluetooth toggle, and also GPS toggle, so all those features are here. Also one for Moto Blur if you want to access that function. Finally, if we go through settings, you can see that version 2.1, which is the operating system on board here. So all in all, performance here pretty similar to the Motorola Click and the Motorola Devour, other Motorola phones at the time that also featured very similar processors and hardware packages, and even the backtrack pad and a lot of those common uh, devices um, were even you know found across the line, such as the Motorola Citrus. And back then, Motorola really was pushing for this whole blur integration with social media and the younger crowd running on Android, uh, compared to what they're doing today with a lot more cleaner installs with not too much skins uh, or optimizations or heavy graphical user interface on top of Android that boggles things down. Right now it's just quite clean and streamlined.
If you still pick one of these up today, it still makes for a decent cell phone in terms of making phone calls and text messages, of course. Uh, the reception is decent, even though it's running on 3G speeds as opposed to 4G LTE, something to keep in mind, and it's also a quad-band GSM device. If you're using it for browsing the web, although it has access to Wi-Fi, you'll notice that a lot of pages won't render completely properly anymore if you still use the default uh, browser that's built in here, which is WebKit-based, since it hasn't been updated in a long time. You can access the store uh, or the marketplace here and then download some more more up-to-date browsers and that should help you a bit but speeds will still be quite slow just because of the nature of this processor um, it's quite outdated by 2017 standards but definitely it's doable and you can still enjoy a few video clips perhaps by youtube on here um, i would re recommend plugging in the headphones here that improves the audio quality and performance here compared to the loudspeaker located on the very back